Welcome back to the miscellaneous channel where we do miscellaneous things. I'm Zeleni. So in this video I am really trying to research and look into sort of feminist media in the late 2010s decade and also look at sort of the rise and fall of this girl boss term and culture that really rose to prominence in the second half of the 2010s decade. The reason this came up is because I've been seeing tweets lately of sort of people making fun of the girl boss term, being critical of it, it being viewed as cringy, and this was just sort of generally on my Twitter timeline, maybe some stuff on TikTok sort of making fun of that. It's very interesting because I feel like I've seen it in real time sort of rise and decline and I think we're in such a different place post 2020 that it's insane to see how fast this sort of evolved and developed if that makes any sense. For the past few videos I've been doing sort of trendy stuff, sort of more commentary videos. Just buckle up for this one. It might be a bit of a longer video but it is going to be full of interesting information that I found out. As like a young millennial woman that went to college, I guess, um, I am like the target demographic for this movement and it's been very interesting to just see it develop in real time. Often when I'm looking and researching trends and things like that, I, it's sort of like with a lot of hindsight and looking at like, like the 2000 celebrity drama or things like that. But in this case, it was so recent and it's still sort of being molded, if that makes sense. So let's just get into it. I'm going to bring up a fair amount of examples from TV and movies that sort of epitomize this culture. But please let me know in the comments of like any I missed. Obviously, I can't watch every show, every movie, and I try to do thorough research, but I haven't watched a lot of these. I've also linked down below quite a few articles that helped me just sort of in my research and are good for just further reading if you're interested about this topic. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> you've probably seen it on social media. I think Instagram is a big place or a big hub of this culture, especially if you're a young millennial woman that is in the workforce you've probably been targeted by this type of media in some way. It is that aesthetic that is sans serif, like kind of thin lettering, pink, millennial pink, let me clarify, gold, a lot of like inspirational quotes, a lot of like self-help books about how to succeed in business as a woman. So I think at the core of like the girl boss, or like boss bitch or whatever you want to call it movement I think it was well intentioned in some ways but there are a lot of flaws with it that are a lot clearer now to more people a lot of people were pointing out flaws with it back then mainly I would say black women queer people trans people disabled people were pointing out the flaws that it maybe isn't as inclusive or intersectional as it claimed to be. The goal of girl boss culture is that women can succeed in the workplace if they just hustle hard enough, they know how to maneuver within the system and are taught these techniques and are empowered to sort of climb the corporate ladder or achieve success, open their own business. We'll get into the flaws with all of that in a bit and I'm going to sort of go through it chronologically and how it sort of rose and fell uh, in the public eye. The term girl boss actually came from this book by the founder of Nasty Gal, which is a clothing company that it's it's mostly online it's kind of fast fashion it's it's cheap and and sort of trendy clothing brand the founder of nasty gal her name is sophia amoruso she published a book in 2014 called hashtag a girl boss 
Yeah, a super cringy <laughs> title now looking at it. So hashtag girl boss sort of became pretty viral as a book. It basically told her story of how she founded a nasty gal. She was kind of like a mess in her life and she uh, started selling vintage clothing on eBay and then built it into this like nasty gal empire. So it was in the early to mid 2010s where sort of this new female character in media was emerging. I honestly think the blueprint for this was Brittany Murphy's character in Uptown Girls. Uh, it was way before this time, but it was sort of that character of like a woman that is flawed and in a more real way. Like she is messy and just more direct or assertive or sort of like objectifying men as like sexual partners more rather than the other way around. But Brittany Murphy's character is sort of a good example of how it was still very glamorized because that movie, in that movie, she is very still glamorous despite being quite a mess. So then the next sort of early instance of this like flawed, messy but real woman was The Mindy Project by Mindy Colling. In this show, Mindy Colling plays a 31-year-old doctor who is sort of wanting to settle down, but her life is a, a bit chaotic and messy, and she is a doctor but is having trouble with other aspects of adulthood. And that's sort of a big, big feature of all of these characters is that they are always sort of like struggling with adulthood. That's why millennials latched onto this type of character so much and it, they became like the target demographic for them because millennials as a generation are sort of like having trouble with accepting adulthood or doing like traditionally adult things, mostly due to like a very <laughs> broken economy and um, lots of other factors that are bigger than this video. Honestly, this sort of rise and decline of like the girl boss culture also worked alongside sort of the rise and fall of like the term adulting and how that went from being a term that was widely used, widely accepted, and used by a lot of millennials to describe sort of their feelings with like the overwhelming responsibilities of being an adult. And girl boss culture was sort of just like the very like girlified version of that. So the Mindy Project aired from 2012 to 2017, I believe. So it was, it started as like one of the earliest. Mindy Collings character is pretty real, pretty raw. She is flawed. She likes to party. The flawed woman sort of splits into two categories. Either she is this girl boss person that is starting her own company, building it from the ground up, becoming a CEO, a CEO, <laughs> as like some people said. There's also like another version of the flawed woman that is a diff it's like the opposite direction and that is the train wreck sort of woman, which in 2014 we had some pieces of media that depicted this type of flawed character. So Broad City is a really good example of this this type of flawed woman who is not so much preoccupied with climbing the ladder or starting her business. She is more, you know, just embracing that she is a mess and she <laughs> is leaning on female friendships. She is a stoner, more raunchy, all the opposite qualities that of like traditionally being a lady. So in 2014, we had Broad City. It pioneered <laughs> this new type of woman character that was emulated a lot moving forward in the, the second half of the decade. Also in 2014 or so, this same Sophia Am Amoruso from Nasty Gal, she opened up a media company based on her hashtag girl boss book and had a Netflix series adapted about her story and her memoir. So it's called Girl Boss on Netflix, and I had just heard of it here and there back then, but I didn't know it was about, like, a true story of this, like, nasty gal founder. In that series, the protagonist, Sophia, also d depicts a lot of 
characteristics of like the Broad City Girls. That's why I'm saying it's the same type of character. They're just sort of like trying to reach different goals. One is career oriented and one is not basically, but they're essentially the same person. I watched one episode of the Girl Boss show and the protagonist is similarly like a partier, sexually empowered, assertive, she shoplifts. So she's not necessarily morally like great. <laughs> and we'll get to that as sort of in the flaws section of this video. Another sort of attribute of this type of character is that they're like sort of mediocre at, <laughs> at things, like which is more realistic of just regular people in general. But that's also sort of important to note that like these are aiming to be realistic characters. And a lot of these times these shows are written by women. They are produced by women. In my opinion, it was sometimes going a bit too far and it was just like, it's just a level of like ridiculousness, especially with Broad City, which I feel weird about that show because my friends really love it still, I believe. And for me, it never really resonated with me because it was so sort of like over the top <laughs> to me and how it depicted these women. I was just like concerned for them. Like, how do you not like, <laughs> I don't know. It just felt like it also depicts female friendships as so close that like in my experience I just don't relate to that level of like intimacy with female friendships like FaceTiming each other during intercourse and things like that. I'm pretty sure people in my real life would be like offended if I did that but I don't know. I, I, I'm sure y'all are watching. Comment below if you wouldn't find that offensive. And I do believe women like this do exist. It just, to me, wasn't, like, really that relatable because it was just like, girl, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> it's weird, but whatever. That That's personal opinion on that. It just felt almost like the studios and the networks were, like, trying to get these women writers to, like, ham it up, ham it up, ham it up to hit us over the head with, like, this real woman archetype like there was no subtlety to these types of characters we're raunchy but somehow still kind of glamorous but also like we're a mess and we do drugs and we have sex and that's good and all but it's just like that's all their life was almost <laughs> i i feel like now we've progressed into wanting a little more subtlety with the types of characters that we like as a society at least i have so Broad City really opened up a portal that, whether we liked it or not, Broad City-esque characters started popping up almost everywhere. Aubrey Plaza did a movie called Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates where her and Anna Kendrick were essentially the Broad City girls. Like, they didn't even try. They just, <laughs> it's like the copy your homework meme and like they didn't even try to make them different. We also had like Two Broke Girls, which was sort of like the sitcom -y version. Another big pioneer of this that I had sort of forgotten about, I had just been thinking of Broad City, but a big pioneer in the 2014-2015 era was Amy Schumer. Her show, Inside Amy Schumer, which was also on Comedy Central. Amy Schumer literally has a movie called Trainwreck that is about a girl like this. So in 2014-2015, all of these projects were sort of underground-ish. They weren't like mainstream, mainstream. Like the Mindy Project, Broad City, Inside Amy Schumer. These were kind of niche sort of pieces of media that like there was hype around for sure. But it was sort of like growing. It was picking up steam. And then I believe there was like a pivotal incident that changed everything. <laughs> and if you haven't guessed already, that was the 2016 election of Donald Trump. The 2016 election was huge and sort of like propelling this type of flawed woman archetype and character into sort of like peak mainstream. And that encompasses this girl boss culture along with these sort of like real women, train wreck archetypes, the Me Too movement, all these things sort of just like skyrocketed into mainstream. The Women's March to me and 2017, three years ago, I think was a pivotal turning point. It was a pivotal moment in getting capitalism's attention on the market available for this type of media. It showed all these companies that there's a huge market and desire for women's empowerment. As usual in our society, when like the white consumer is interested in something and shows like a big passion for something, 
that is like the biggest motivator to capitalist entities to sort of just capitalize on that and make things that cater to that huge market and demographic and want and need from the people. So I am working on this sort of like <laughs> trend graph of like how trends sort of rise and fall in general, not just this trend. This is it. <laughs> um, it makes no sense right now and I will, I, I'll probably do a video on it that just shows different examples. But basically, my graph shows that a trend has some slow and steady growth, organic growth. That is like the 2012 to 2015 era of the shows coming out like Broad City, Mindy Project, uh, Inside Amy Schumer, Insecure on HBO, which I will talk about. I have like a capitalism threshold turning point where the slope becomes steeper and the Women's March in 2017 was that moment. After that, in 2017 through 2019, this trend just really skyrocketed into so many aspects of media culture. So usually, to me, the golden era happens in that slow and steady growth period right before capitalism takes notice. That is where you'll find, like, the golden era of whatever thing. So, like, Broad City was, like, a well-received show critically in comedy. A show like Insecure was hugely amazing. Also started out in this era. The show Girl Boss was never good, I don't think. But like, I think for that era, it it was new and fresh. And capitalism takes notice. Obviously, they sort of run the trend up in consciousness because there is so much exposure, so much publicity around it. It, it goes so far as to like sell out. <laughs> this is totally made up by me. This is not based on any, <laughs> any research or science. So once a thing sells out, it takes a while, but people sort of start to criticize it. So criticisms begin to form around this concept. So I would say this like selling out period where companies are trying to capitalize off it is all of the copycat Broad City things. So the Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates movie, movies like Bad Moms, like Someone Great on Netflix that feature sort of raunchy groups of friends, like female friendships. The Bold Type was a big show that was like very cheesed out version of this girl boss concept. It was a show about three friends in New York that they have this type of close, uh, no boundaries female friendship and they're constantly trying to fight for feminism in their workplace, which they work at this cosmopolitan type magazine. So many of these <laughs> feminism things and media took place in New York City. That was just like a common theme, I guess. Again, I think it is Broad City's influence. The Bold Type was a good example of mixing a little Broad City, but it was more about the girl boss sort of concepts of like sticking up for yourself in the workplace. I used to hate watch that show a lot. I, I did for years and I noticed right off the bat how corny it was and how unrealistic it was, even though it was it was hypocritical because it was trying to be this like super realistic, you know, we're real girls, we're real women. But so many of the things that happened in it were so unrealistic that I was just like, this is such a paradox and it's stupid. And I, yes, I hate watched it, but I was criticizing it the whole time. <laughs> I even got into a fight with the writers of The Bold Type on Twitter <laughs> back then because I was so bad. They had this whole storyline where one of the characters um, was trying to write a piece about VR technology and she did a focus group. A significant percentage of them got like very dizzy and nauseous during the trial of the VR thing. She found out it was because they were all on their period and I was just like, are you fucking kidding me? I looked into the science of it after that episode and it is very, very, very slight chance that if you're on your period, VR might make you nauseous. But, like, it is so slim that it was unrealistic the amount of people in, in the show that got the nausea. And to me, I felt so, like, annoyed because, like, gaming and VR and technology are already, like, sort of very exclusionary of women participating in them. It felt like reductive. It, it, it felt like it was giving men yet another reason to like 
bar women from technology a little bit. Like, I know that was not their intention, and they were very mad at me and their tweets at me, but as a gamer, I was offended. I'm a fan of VR, and I don't care if I'm on my period. I'm gonna do it anyway, so <laughs> it just was so silly, and, and they had the audacity to fight me about it when I was just giving them, you know, some criticism. <laughs> Younger is another show that is sort of like about this girl boss sort of culture. And another thing I notice with these shows sometimes, I'm sort of referring to the bull type and someone great here, but there, I see it all the time. The writers of these things often want to pile on like all of the minority <laughs> traits to one character. I'm just so over that at this point and I do think we're moving in a direction that is not that anymore. In both like Someone Great and The Bold Type, you have like a black queer woman character and that's great and all but then you have like all these white girl characters that are just a basic straight white girl. And that's where Insecure comes in which was in this golden era before like big capitalism noticed. Insecure is a show on HBO about made by Issa Rae and it centers this friendship of two black women and her sort of just like figuring out adulthood just like all these other characters we've talked about but this is like the one piece of media on this list that I've seen that that actually shows a very realistic depiction of this adulting concept they are trying to show. It shows like the very real <laughs> aspects of like working with white liberals specifically you can really tell in Insecure that it is written by a black woman that <laughs> is not afraid and and there's no it doesn't seem like there's like a big studio or network presence that is like sort of manipulating the narrative to either tone it down or ham it up too much. It's like just it's perfectly real and subtle but still shows like comedy and a little drama and romance and like all these same struggles that th these other media are attempting but this one does it in a way that's very real and addresses like race which a lot of these other things just show like a diverse group of friends. I don't know sometimes I just feel like these shows are just trying to put in like every color of the rainbow into the show which is better than nothing better than before when we just had all white people in a show. Um, but at least now, <laughs> 2020 and 2021, I think we've moved past that and people are really craving like more authentic characters like the type that were on Insecure. They're not just like there to fill the diversity quota. We saw it in that KFC Lifetime movie where they just had like a queer black guy as the best friend. So after capitalism sort of like does its thing, there's a million copycats of the concept. They sort of like sell out the concept, we lose sight of the original sort of mission. A lot of critiques start to happen. Usually critiques happen early on too, once like capitalism takes place. There are criticisms, but they are more like on the fringe of pop culture. And there's a, a certain point where a, a concept or a trend sells out so much that the majority of people start to critique it and view it as cringy. A few things happened that influence the girl boss trend to fall off and be criticized that are very valid. So for example, a lot of these like female girl boss CEOs or female founded companies started either going bankrupt, having allegations of sexual misconduct, having allegations of like toxic workplaces, like toxic labor practices. So these companies were sort of revealed as you know, what they really were on the inside and what they're preaching online was sort of more performative. For example, the Nasty Gal founder, first of all, it's like a fast fashion company and, you know, fast fashion notoriously exploits garment workers, uh, workers overseas, and that is just like completely hypocritical to the idea of feminism that they're trying to preach. Other companies that sort of fell into this, like CEOs having to step away or going bankrupt or something, were like the founder of Away, which was that luggage company, Thinks, that period underwear, uh, Glossier, Anastasia Beverly Hills, the makeup company. I know they have horrible sort of like workplace turnover, their reviews on Glassdoor are a whole trip. <laughs> 
So all of these were like female owned companies that preached, you know, girl bossery and uh, <laughs> they do not practice what they preach inside their own workplace, which to me is not surprising because a lot of the flaw in the philosophy of the girl boss sort of concept and theory was it basically encouraged women to game the system and play the man's game basically to get to the top and act sort of like men <laughs> to get there and that they deserve to reach success if they do act that way instead of dismantling the system that is oppressive in the first place. What ends up happening is these women that climb to the top are still sort of oppressing those people underneath them because they are still playing the same game. It's the same system. It's the same sexist, racist, ableist, uh, classes system and if they are not dismantling that then they are just sort of the new oppressor which doesn't actually reflect actual feminism another just kind of side note on this girl boss thing and and the annoying thing about the term girl boss is that it's like the word girl is sort of like not preferred by most women i don't think it's kind of like infantilizing and demeaning and you never hear any man called a boy boss. <laughs> so the late 2010s brought about a lot of this sort of reckoning of women founders or CEOs that were being exposed over how they were handling their business in whatever oppressive manner potentially. Ellen's another example of someone exposed a powerful woman exposed uh, for a toxic workplace. The whole girl boss movement, the, this feminist movement in both media and just like the girl boss culture in general, very much about the hustle, very much about rise and grind. I think 2020 really brought to light for most people that that is not the root of the issue in this country. And also like all of these movements have not changed many things for the better for people. 2020 left a ton of women unemployed at a disproportionate rate. White supremacy was like further exposed with like many women supporting Trump, the majority of white women supporting Donald Trump, someone that was like openly supposedly sexist and a sexual assaulter man. 2020 also exposed sort of like healthcare and childcare and how broken those systems are and how that is like hit that hits women harder because they are like the primary child care takers. Reproductive rights policy is still being debated and <laughs> all that crap. So basically this girl boss movement that's been going on for over five years has not yielded this great change that it sort of promises if you hustle hard enough and you you work hard enough, you can get there. Also 2020 has sort of revealed the wealth gap and how that plays such a big part in founding <laughs> companies and being able to succeed in business a lot of the time. Uh, that takes capital and a lot of times people that are able to start companies that are successful have uh, access to capital before they even begin. I've seen a lot of great organizations pop up that are trying to center intersectional feminism and racial justice and trans rights and all these things that are part of feminism. They're an important part of feminism. But like the majority of the, the media that was representing this time and sort of like the commodification of the girl boss aesthetic was very, very white and it stood at the intersection of privilege and oppression where like they benefited from their privilege but weren't acknowledging it and were feeling more oppressed as a result of the Trump administration and whatnot. It just became very performative as many things do when capitalism takes a hold. At its core, feminism and capitalism <laughs> are opposing ideologies and that is why <laughs> When you get a capitalist version of feminism, you are not going to get the real, the real real <laughs> about what is going on. There were some real moments in some of these other pieces of media, the Mindy Project, Insecure, where the writers and creators were given 
freedom and they had a unique perspective. Well, Insecure definitely had, was very realistic. That one is sort of like an exception to the rule of all of these media that I've talked about. These were sort of like as real as it got, but most of the other things were just like more centered around white feminism and just not getting into the intersectional issues of feminism. And I think that is why that concept has died and is very much viewed as cringy now. A lot of people are seeing the flaws. They've been radicalized by 2020. I think many people have been. It's been quite a journey. <laughs> so I have some 2020 examples that have a very different reception than their counterparts pre-2020. So for example, Emily in Paris was sort of like the 2020 version of this girl boss concept about this young woman that goes to Paris and because she is American and assertive and a girl boss, she is able to transform this marketing company. She <laughs> just goes to France and uh, sort of imposes her culture on everybody. That show was received very, very poorly by most people. It was seen as sort of a joke show, a guilty pleasure if someone enjoyed it. I think if it had come out pre-2020, maybe in 2017, it would have been more of like a funsy show. Even though I think it would still be criticized, it's pretty cringy in general, but it might have been received better. And in 2020, it was just received as like, what the hell? Like, this girl is crazy and she is just imposing her own <laughs> ideals on a whole other country, like going into their country, telling them how to run a company. It just did not succeed as being like this empowering show. And I saw some articles after it came out and stuff saying, oh, it was meant to be an ambient TV or it was meant to be, you know, stupid. <laughs> I don't believe that at all. Oh, I don't think any show sets out, or I don't think most shows set out to be stupid. <laughs> Another movie that I actually gave it a watch earlier today was called Like a Boss. It's a movie starring Tiffany Haddish and some blonde girl, I don't know. And it has a lot of A-list actors in it. It has Jennifer Coolidge, Billy Porter, Sama Hayek. And I think the movie suffers from <laughs> being taken seriously because it is one of these like over-the-top comedy blockbuster type movies. Like, The Wedding Crashers opened a portal to media that is for a whole other video, but it's this type of comedy that is just, like, very over-the-top and raunchy. It depicted the girl boss concept in an interesting way because it's about two friends that start a company, and then Salma Hayek's character is, like, a big exec at a big beauty company. She offers to invest in their company, and she's kind of the antagonist trying to, like, take over the company the whole time, sort of pitting the two best friends against each other in order for her to gain control of the company. Unfortunately, yeah, it was a bad movie. It was such a, like, sellout-ish movie that it had a Wix product placement <laughs> at some point. The A-list actors couldn't really save the comedy part. It was very just cheesy type stuff, but I did think it was very interesting to see Salma Hayek, a Hispanic woman, playing sort of this role of like antagonist. I, I think it did a good job in showing how like women and even Hispanic women, any anyone can still be an oppressor no matter who you are. This lady was really trying to exploit <laughs> the ideas of these young creative women with their startup. Essentially, by the 2015 definition, Salma Hayek's character is a girl boss. She's a CEO, uh, but she is also, you know, evil <laughs> in this movie. It got so close to critiquing the, the real flaw of it and that it's being a woman CEO doesn't mean you're a good person. It's just interesting that this movie sort of addressed it. Unfortunately, I don't know if it meant to address this really or if it was just like, we have Sama Hayek, like, yay. It was a dumb movie. It was not well written necessarily, but I did think that that part of it was interesting and it, it sort of reflected a more modern take on this whole concept. I mean, if you think about it, this movie is probably greenlit and, and, and adopted into production 2018-2019, so it, it was pre-2020, I'm assuming that this was, this was created, so it was sort of that late stage of, like, disillusionment, but not quite there yet where, like, we're rejecting girl boss culture completely in the mainstream. So I think in, in a couple of years, we might start seeing really the effects of 2020 on the idea of feminism in media. I think it's still too early to see how 
that has impacted and changed everything because it really has changed everything. It has radicalized people that weren't radicalized before. 2020 revealed a lot of like a lot of the issues with rise and grind and hustle culture and how that was sort of brainwashing for, you know, actually toxic workplace conditions. And I hope it is for the better. I hope it leads to more real characters in media, uh, more diverse writers and directors. I think that is really the key. A show like Insecure, a show like The Mindy Project, they are good quality and, and hold up. I mean, I don't know so much about the Mindy Project. I watched one episode, uh, the first episode. <laughs> Insecure definitely holds up. Like, I watched it now, and it 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 makes sense. Like, black people have been saying all of these things, and uh, all of the things that were revealed in 2020 weren't revealed for everybody. A lot of people already knew these things, but, but these things were revealed to the general white public and be it products or shows or, or media, radio, books, everything comes down to the people at the top and who are the people at the top? White men, maybe white women, uh, for the most part. I know this is kind of like a lot to cover and a heavy-ish video, not heavy, but like it's very interesting to have witnessed this trajectory in real time. And I do think this era and this concept brought about some good things. I think the girl boss concept, if anything, it helped women like maybe feel more empowered at work to ask for a raise if they weren't before or call out sexism or discrimination. The problem is like still today we don't see much change and it's because these concepts don't focus on the structural issues they focus on the individual and i think 2020 revealed that the individual isn't the problem in the united states so this video is definitely biased towards the united states because that is my experience but i think similar trends have happened in other countries throughout the past uh, few years or the last decade unfortunately i don't know much about that i think the shows that showed like the flawed woman or like the train wreck women um maybe helped women feel more just seen or they were able to see things they relate to feel more empowered sexually or romantically or feel like they're not alone and feeling overwhelmed by adult responsibilities i think there's a lot of good that came from this media <laughs> and these characters but it's important to note the flaws as well and how we have progressed in such a short amount of time. This is a lot to cover, but please let me know in the comments what you think. What do you think of the whole girl boss concept, the flawed woman? Are there any other shows or characters that sort of depict this stereotype? Any good ones, any bad ones? Uh, I'd love to hear about it. I'm counting on y'all to add any I missed. There's a lot of work to do, but I really think in a couple of years we'll be seeing the results of like a more awakened <laughs> hollywood or i don't know though sometimes uh, i don't i don't know if you like this video please like and subscribe to my channel i put out videos on tuesdays and thursdays tentatively tuesday is sort of a more hefty video and thursday is a more casual or shorter video is what i'm going for you can follow me at miscellaneous on twitter and instagram to find out when my videos come out or turn on the bell notification here on YouTube. And I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.